Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Challenge-Based Procurement. Is it right for you? Thank you for spending some time with us today. We're glad you're here. Be sure to check out our upcoming Cronin webinar series. The first in this series is Interagency Data-Driven Collaboration. This is Wisconsin's innovative approach to specification development. It will be held next week, Wednesday, October 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Registration is open for that and all of the webinars in this series. Visit naspo.org to register. And I think the link will be in the chat. We look forward to seeing you there. At the close of today's presentation, you will be asked to complete a very brief questionnaire. Your feedback is very valuable to us here at NASPO. Today's presentation is good for one contact hour. To get your certificate, simply complete the questionnaire following the presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to explain the format of today's webinar. All attendees are muted. You can enter comments and questions into the chat box. If you would like to ask our presenters a question, you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your window. Questions will be addressed during the presentation and a Q&A session will be at the end as time allows. I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers today. We are honored to have with us Ben Flores, Assistant Deputy Director, Statewide Technology Procurement Division, California Department of Technology and Cameron Sadiq, CEO and founder of City Innovate. NASPO is great, grateful to have you both here with us. And now I will turn it over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, first of all, I'm very, very pleased that you allow me to spend an hour of your time. I think we're going to talk about a subject that could be very, very important and can uh, really help uh, procurement officials in solicitations. Uh, not only in time, but more importantly, in the improvement of the vendor selected to be very highly likely to be successful. Uh, with respect to me a little bit, I've had about 30 years of procurement experience associated with NASA on the space shuttle. Uh, yes, I'm showing my age. And uh, in the state of California departments. And over the last 18 months, I have been this in senior management uh, leader at, at the California Department of Technology in uh, implementing and enhancing uh, our, our director, our director Amy Tong, vision of using challenge-based procurement methodology in order to significantly reduce IT project solicitation durations. And so thank you very much on that. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Cameron in a moment, but I wanted to at, at least give you some sort of insight there. Uh, this next slide, please. Uh, this next slide, uh, go back one. There we go. That's it. Uh, this next slide, even though it's a picture slide, it's actually very, very important because it involves teamwork. Uh, you can't just do it by yourself. Uh, I want to personally, it starts at the top. And fortunately, uh, we have we have a very, very bright uh, a, a director. Her name is Amy Tong, and she basically has provided the executive leadership and the vision of how to move forward. She gave us challenges here at in the statewide technology procurement division, and the challenges were to reduce the time of solicitation from currently solicitations run between 18 to 24 months. She wanted it reduced to six months. We achieved that. But more importantly, we made a very other important achievement, and I'll talk about that. Secondly, I'd like to thank my old boss, Marlon Powell. Uh, he was uh, my deputy director who got me involved with this concept, and basically, he let me loose to establish clear solicitation processes and to make this work. And um, I really want to thank him for the advice and counsel that he gave me and every time I came up with uh, ideas, I'd run them by him and he would tweak them along the way. But uh, he was very, very instrumental in, in helping me along in making this happen. Lastly, I'd like to, to my outstanding staff, uh, my branch chiefs and the procurement officials who believed in my thinking to make it happen. Uh, currently, we've used the challenge-based procurement process for about, let's see, eight solicitations. I currently have four challenge-based procurements in flight and I'm providing the challenge-based procurement presentation 
uh, solicitation methodology to departments at approximately three times a month. In fact, I gave two of them this morning with respect like that. Next slide, please, Josh. Now I'd like to introduce a, a very important partner and it's City Innovate. Uh, Marlon Paulo, my, uh, my, dep my old boss, he left in January of this year and he brought in uh, a very bright company called City Innovate. And City Innovate has a lot of uh, background associated with challenge-based procurement. And uh, I was very fortunate to work with these two individuals, Jay and Cameron. Uh, and they kind of helped me with respect to, to providing me the building blocks and facilitating a little bit of some things. And then I took it from there. And then we have worked together as teammates City Innovate and and uh, and CDT have worked as teammates on a number of the solicitations. So let me give a little time to Cameron so he can talk a little bit about his company. Thank you, thank you, Ben, um, and to uh, Josh and Rebecca from NASPO for inviting City Innovate uh, to this webinar. Uh, as Ben said, we you know we probably wouldn't be here without CDT. So I do want to say a big thank you there, but. I won't spend too long. Uh, I know we've got a long presentation to go through, but City Innovate is headquartered here in California. It was a nonprofit in its early years. Um, it is now a public benefit corporation and its mission is to build technology for public good. Both myself and, and Jay Nath are co-CEOs. What's interesting is that Jay, who is the CIO at the city and county of San Francisco, about seven years ago in 2014, founded a program called Startup in Residence. And underpinning startup and residence was how do we bring all this talent that we have in our cities, counties, and states across the U.S., how do we get them engaged in helping solve for problems that our communities and governments face? And at the heart of it was trying to figure out procurement. And, and sort of that procurement component led to us looking at a program that DOD was running at the time, talking about how do we reduce the time it takes uh, for innovators to respond uh, to solicitations. And again, Ben's going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it's come a long way, but that's exactly what Jay was able to sort of figure out was, hey, we can sort of reduce the time it takes young vendors to get to the table and remove all those frictions that we traditionally see with young vendors. The federal government, Department of Commerce, EDA, funded that program to go from the city and county of San Francisco to regional. Um, we then got more funding as that program moved over to City Innovate. Jay joined uh, City Innovate as well, and that program then went national. Um, we had over to, we have over 50 cities, counties, and governments now working with us, and our big, big challenge was how do we take that from a program and create scalability and replicability, and so we ended up building software. And again, Ben uh, will probably talk to most of this and how we've been working hand-in-hand -hand with the state of California, uh, but, you know, we've got over, uh, you know, $1.5 billion now that is going through challenge-based procurement. Again, Ben will talk more to it. Uh, next slide, please. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight this a little and then pass it to Ben to elaborate. As I was, you know, you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, the governor in his first day in office three years back, uh, obviously, there's a lot of executive orders going on, but this was his second executive order on, on that day one, which was pr around procurement, that there's got to be a better way for us to, you know, uh, better serve our citizens, uh, move quickly on addressing a lot of the barriers that we face in modernization. And a part of that was around acquisitions. So you can see how there was an executive order around RFI squared, having a clear eye on startup and residence. And to Ben's point, uh, this is how we started working with uh, the state CIO, Amy Tong, Marlon Paolo, Ben's old boss, and, and actually Ben in the weeds in executing this. So again, we've been very honored to work with CDT and, and Ben, I'll pass it back to you here. Thank you very much, Cameron. As um, as Cameron said, we picked it, we started with RFI squared and that's where I picked up the information and the basics and then uh, took it from there and, and modified challenge-based procurement massively. We have really changed the solicitation process and it's really turned out to be a very, very successful associate. Next slide, please. 
the key takeaways of this presentation is, is I want to go through what's being done here at the California Department under the executive leadership and vision of uh, Department Director Amy Tong. Again, our, we're very, very fortunate with, uh, with Madam uh, Director Amy Tong with respect to her vision, expectations of what she's looking for. Uh, very, very sharp uh, young lady and it gave us a challenge and we stepped up to it and she has been very happy with our achievements. Uh, what we wanna do is, what, what we're trying to show you is if the challenge-based procurement can be utilized through your next solicitation. We originally had the challenge to significantly reduce the duration from 18 to 24 months to six months. We accomplished that. that, that but while I'll tell you what has turned out to be the more important thing, and this is the, the message I'm gonna to try to leave you, one of the messages I wanna leave you. It really increases the level of successful project implementation, the state project management interaction with the final set selected vendor team. That is more important. It's one thing to create a solicitation, award it to a vendor, and then the procurement group shouldn't just wash their hands and say, okay, it's not our problem anymore because someone else is gonna to have to manage the, the actual activity. And I think this particular process really increases the level of success. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a very important slide. It's kind of a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, got a lot of pictures, but one of the things that we had to be concerned about when, I, when Marlon asked me to start worrying about this is to how do we, how do we do this? Because we got to stop getting procurement staff being burnt out uh, uh, associated, you know, with the efforts running procurement after procurement after procurement. So the goals uh, CDT established with department CIOs, their CTOs, and their CPOs is how can we increase the capacity of our people? How can we accelerate and go to market with our solicitation rapidly? And can we automate the entire process and learn from the efforts associated with that? Uh, I wanna share with you, we accomplished this in 18 months, we pulled it off. We made, uh, we made uh, massive strides. And again, it was due to some really great uh, belief by my executive leadership that we could, we could make this happen. And also my staff, who believed in me and 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 with respect to and pulled it off. With respect to people, uh, what we wanted to do, we wanted to increase the capacity. So we wanted to foster a culture of excellence and capacity through training. We wanted to focus on advanced procurement training. So we actually looked at different classes associated with procurement that were more agile in math method as opposed to maybe traditional methods. So we focused on that and we, uh, we asked our people to, to attend those classes. In fact, I actually asked, I created a class to something that I learned back at NASA when I used to uh, do requirements analysis and testing on the this, on this flight software for the space shuttle. And that was in, in uh, requirements analysis and business analysis. So we actually had every person in the procurement group take this business analysis class. And it turned out to be very, very important and very helpful. We want to increase the productivity of the people. So what we did is we actually came up with a, a metric measurement tools and to de determine where we were wasting time. And uh, that turned out to be very critical. It's sort of like you, what, whatever, whatever you manage, you need to measure. Whenever you measure, you need to manage. And then we need to improve the alignment with best practices. And that's where the challenge-based procurement solicitation process came up. The process Excel, Excel, the process Excel, itself, excuse me, uh, uh, our deputy, our, our director wanted us to move away from big monolithic procurements and go to a phased agile approach and create an iterative approach to accelerate time to market. So break up the monolithic projects, the monolithic solicitations into, uh, into uh, 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 smaller solicitations. And what we did is this provided more of a modular functionality 
for the solicitations. But more importantly, it started showing the validation that we were providing the right solution for the department. So they started getting an increased buy-in along the way. It reduced the burden uh, on, on vendors and state staff. Uh, the excessive solicitation times when I was on, when I was a, a vendor for a long period of time, when it we took two years to go through a procurement, even my key personnel that I was thinking of putting on the on the that I bid, they may have already been gone or doing something else. And that really put a lot of pressure upon vendors. So this particular process we we've come up with is really uh, has has changed that. And the this and the interaction, this is key, the proof of concept, and I'll talk about that, the proof of concept interaction really improves the product to the state. The proof of concept interaction really improves the product to the state. And I'll spend more time talking about that later. Then we wanted the other part of the, the other thing was is the tech crowd. We wanted to automate, and we needed to automate via tools. And that's where City Innovate came involved. We utilized their tools, their pipeline manager, their solicitation builder to document the templates, the automation, lever leverage historical solicitation. We loaded all our past solicitations into the solicitation builder so that whenever we run another solicitation, always the solicitation builder would simply pull that template out and it automatically populate the entire solicitation. And all we have to do is start modifying it with the new statement of works and the new evaluation criteria. And another thing, it's real-time document editing and collaboration, both from the state and the department standpoint. So uh, City Innovate Solicitation Builder was a key success factor in us moving forward. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, we have been fortunate because this challenge-based procurement process has been it's turned out to be very uh, positive, and a lot of departments are very interested in it. Uh, I've been asked to give this uh, this uh, as a class as part of the CDT IT Leadership Academy and that and the Project Management Leadership Academy. And uh, I, in fact, I finished one three days ago associated with that on giving a challenge-based procurement uh, presentation on how this, this particular process can massively change the entire thought process of how to do procurements. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to uh, Cameron to talk the next two bullets because uh, he is his his particular company has has been very very taken the leadership on some training activities associated with uh, providing uh, some modules for CDT. And and I'll be very quickly quick here as as Ben was sharing you know uh, you know OCM is always a big component you know training folks building the capacity so we do have uh, trainings that we have on challenge based procurement we do one day training for executives. Um, we do two-day trainings for procurement officials and two-day trainings for project managers, really on how to do a challenge-based procurement, but at the same time also how to do these agile procurements and how they fit into everybody's unique, uh, you know, legislative codes. Uh, that that's an important piece, and obviously we have a lot of this material that we can always share. Um, and it's something that we're looking at doing with uh, NASPO. There's been conversations with Rebecca and team on making sure that you know um, there's probably a future partnership where we would pass the trainings to, to NASPO. So you know those who are interested, please do get in touch with, with Ben at the end. Um, but yeah, Ben, back to you. Okay, next slide, please, Josh. Okay, what this is is just a simple slide uh, because you might be curious with respect to this challenge-based procurement solicitation methodology. What is it? How, does, how can it apply? Is it only for small solicitations is a big one? I want to share you, we've done it as, as small as 100,000. And we're currently, right now, we've got a solicitation in flight that's about for the state controller's office. That's over $450 million. So this particular process is very, very scalable associated with that. Next slide, please. 
As I said, the technology is, is one of the key things and that's the solicitation builder. I elaborated a little bit already about that. But more importantly, this is something I had to figure out. I had to figure out how to map the technology, i.e. what, uh, what CI was creating to the California contracting policies and procedures. So I had to map that to the state contracting man manuals of, of California and make sure that we have that alignment there so that everything we create in Solicitation Builder is per statute and is per regulation and is per policy. And we were able to do that with both Solicitation Builder and Pipeline Manager. Next slide, please. Hey, Ben, we actually have a question in the chat box, Q&A. Um, okay. It's from Stasa Ray. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, they're a uh, procurement attorney. Uh, and the question is, I've been researching agile and iterative modular processes for a couple of months. How did you navigate California's procurement laws in developing the CBP? Have there been any issues? Um, no, yes. That's my weakness because unfortunately, I went to law school and I, I'm going to take the bar next year. So I don't want to be disbarred before I take the bar. So uh, <laughs> yes, there have been issues, uh, but I'll tell you what we did is I spent a lot of time with the, uh, our CDT legal, uh, especially our, our, uh, our, our, our general counsel. And I guess the other advantage I've had is uh, the, when I came to California Department of Technology, I actually uh, was assigned in the legal department for about a year and a half. And I wrote about 60, 60 uh, opinions under the direct supervision of the my uh, general counsel of CDT, Tony Lewis, who taught me a lot about with respect to what an attorney can do and cannot do in an IT project. And I was able to educate him because I have more of a background associated with IT project management and IBMV and testing and things like that and help him align. When we have our new, our new general counsel, her name is uh, Sahana Ad, she uh, very much wanted to learn this process. And I will also share with you, Sahana, our general counsel is so positive on this after I've spent the time explaining to her and the positive, she actually uses Solicitation Builder herself. And uh, that really, I was really happy to see that. And she thinks it's neat uh, with respect like that. So, uh, to make a long story short is yes, there was a problem. I had to explain the process. I had to show how we were mapping the statutes, mapping the policies. And once I did that, the other thing is we make sure that we keep legal appraised along the way during the entire solicitation. They're always aware of what we're creating because remember we're using solicitation builder and it's a collaboration tool. So our CDT legal can watch how it's being built along the way. And then when we get ready, when it's totally done, then we turn it over to CDT legal plus other individuals and CDT legal then looks at it, validates it. It's not the first time they've ever seen it. And then they say, okay, good. It sounds good, Ben. Release it and let it go out for signature. I hope I answered your question. And by the way, I don't have any problem, and I'll talk a little bit, I don't have any problem spending more time one-on-ones talking to anybody about anything specific stuff. But can you give me a little bit more details behind it? Next slide, please. Okay, the learning objectives. We're gonna show you the, talk about the differences between the, the challenge-based procurement and traditional solicitation, uh, the benefits, the major steps, the key six factors, for success of the challenge-based procurement. And we're gonna go through a use case on CalVex. Next slide, please. Okay, okay, now we're getting down to the, the details of this stuff. In the traditional method of doing a procurement, the state identifies a solution, vendors quote to implement, and then the state evaluates a paper proposal. Okay, that's the traditional way. And I can identify that because I was on the vendor side for a number of years. The innovative process that we hear is it's different. The state identifies 
the problem. The vendors propose solutions to the problem and then the state evaluates the proof of concept. So what we had to do is I had to do a shift in thinking with, uh, with CDT and with the departments that we're going to be moving to more of an agile phase development transition, like I said, from monolithic to a modular system specifications, rapid procurement approach and collaborative sessions with the state and vendors. I'll talk more about that later. State challenges the vendors, you need to now show me, don't tell me. That means you got to show me you can do it. Just don't tell me on a piece of paper you can do it. And then we use the, uh, the challenge-based procurement with the proof of concept. Uh, Next slide, please. Okay. And this particular, this simple slide, it's, it kind of iterates what I said before, but think of it this way. When we do a challenge-based procurement, really the state is providing the what and the why. The what and the why. And, we're, and we want the vendors to provide the how with respect like that. That's key. However, what makes it different is the chat. You might say, well, Florence, that, that's no different than kind of a regular proposal because a regular proposal provides the how. This is how we would design it. What's different in the challenge-based procurement is with respect to the POC and that the, the proof of concept is the key and the heart and soul of the challenge-based procurement uh, where they're utilizing, because in the old days, many vendors used to use hard-coded screens to demo. Yeah, I can do what you want. And I, I hard-coded a screen and I utilized internal matching data. And I can show you with great smoke and mirror, you know, you know, with smoke and mirrors that I can really achieve, achieve your problem. Well, our particular process that we developed is much different than that. Next slide, please. Think of the major steps in a challenge-based procurement as a process is like a funnel. The phase one is the minimum qualifications and scenario, uh, scenario narratives. I'll talk about that later. And then the phase two is the proof of concept and the phase three is the negotiations. But really what we're doing is this funnel where we're continually narrowing down the qualifying vendors to invite the top vendors to the to the uh, to evaluate excuse me the top vendors to negotiate uh, and provide who the best vendor is going to be let me tell you there's a trick that we came I came up with in the negotiations and I'll also talk that up too next slide please now we're going to get some key here's the major steps and by the way I'm doing this fairly quickly because I usually give a presentation on challenge based procurement it takes me an hour and a half to do it. So I'm doing it as fast as I can, but I think I'm giving you the, the, the gist of it. And like I said, I'm gonna, I, I'll have contact information if you want me to talk to any of you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The phase one, think of it as the compliance phase. Administration, administrative MQs, mandatory qualifications, can the bidders qualify to perform a level of effort? And the POC narrative responses to state supplied project scenarios. Now, these are key. Think of it this way. I have this massive system I want to create. What we do is we say we create three to 10 scenarios of really would, really would be able to prove that the essence of the main system. I, I had a meeting this morning at nine o'clock uh, today with another department. They provided me with 17 scenarios. And after going through it and talking to them, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't, I don't understand their business, but I, I do understand, I am an engineer, so I kind of picked up on some of the things. I got it down to nine. And I said, here's the nine scenarios you really only need for this. And the light bulb went on associated. And then I had to change a lot of the wording associated in the scenarios. But they are outcome based. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please. Okay, here is the heart and soul of the challenge based procurement, the proof of concept. It's typically 45 to 90 days, and it depends upon the number and the complexity of scenarios. What it is during the proof of concept 
during this 40 to 90 calendar days. The state and the bidder participate in individual weekly POC sessions where the bidder presents their agile developed POC. Think about it this way. Maybe week one, uh, the bidder shows, okay, I'm providing you scenario one and two. Week two, they're providing scenario number three and so on. But the key is, is all the POC bidders do not have to run at the same time. So bidder one could say, I'm providing you bid scenario one and two on week one, but bidder two can say, I'm providing you a scenario number three on week one. You don't want to limit that. They just have to complete all the scenarios and all the mid-level requirements. But the more important thing, it's collaborative, a collaborative discussions, questions going back and forth where the basically the, the state gets the opportunity to look at the vendor and say, no, 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 no. You missed it on scenario two. Where is step four and five? And then the bidders are going to look and say, oh my God, you're right, I missed it. And why would, and of course a bidder wants to win. So guess what? The next week they're busting their rear ends to make sure they fix that. And they put step four and five of that scenario in there and they show it to you. So you see the collaboration going back and forth with respect to them associated with that. We don't, we being the state, don't tell them how to develop the system. We just tell them what we want and why we want it. Now, the bidder owns the weekly POC sessions. So we don't own them. It's their meetings, their being the bidder's meetings. The bidder presents their current developed product and outlines their planned subsequent efforts. The bidder's POC, this is key, the bidder's POC product is workable code utilized for the base system development. It's not throwaway code. So everything that's being created during the POC is going to be lifted and if they're selected and, and actually then moved to the, the base system. And it's going to be part of the building block of the base system. The bidder's POC final workable design product will be evaluated by the state, make sure it addresses every one of the project scenarios and all the POC mid-level requirements. State evaluates the bidder's full system proposal and the tech cost proposal. Remember, the POC was only a subset of what they want, but at the very, very end, they're submitting their proposal. Now, think about this now. If you had 45, 60 days monitoring Bidder. You're going to start seeing what system I'm really starting to like. More importantly, you're going to see the how well the teams are working together, how well they're being meshed. And uh, is that the team that appears to uh, know what's going on, as opposed to many vendors, they have a group that just builds proposals. And then once they win the deal, they turn it over to an implementation group and the implementation group quickly runs through and tries to read the proposal and say, oh my God, what did we just get signed up for? So you now as the department, if you see, I like this company. I like that project manager. I like that application development. I like that test. I can see how one finishes the sentence of another. This is a good group. Go share that. Next slide, please. Phase three is negotiations, and it's the opportunity for the state to modify the final system requirements based upon the state's observation of all bidders POC, select the best value the state required, integrate design and system. Now, this, this bullet is really important. You saw three bidders during the POC. Let's say you really like bidder number two. God, I really like their 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 design, I really liked everything that they did, but I liked a piece of I saw in, 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 in bidder one, and I liked a piece of I saw in bidder three. Well, then what you do is you modify the requirements, but you provide those modified requirements to all three bidders and give all three bidders the opportunity to respond via a baffle, best final offer. So they then give you a best and final offer that includes not only just the cost, but the focus on the addition. 
And then you can kind of look at that and say, hmm, I like that. Now, here's the second bullet is key. The state interviews the bidders submitted key personnel contained within the full system design. Okay, you just spent 60 days watching a team that was just really cohesive. Really loved that team. And then you saw, and you really liked the, uh, the, the application developer. And then you see the key personnel for the application developer. Instead of it being Cameron, who you really liked, you saw Ben Flores. And you said, who the heck is he? He was never involved. No, I want Cameron. I want Cameron. You, he was involved in the POC. You bid him and, and you change him out. And I've had a number of discussions, heavy discussions with many vendors and say, you're not going to do a, a bait and switch on me. Not now. You're going to now give me that team. I want that team. And if you don't give me that team, I guess we're not going to have a discussion with you during negotiations. Mark my words. You think they'll want to walk away and say, no, nah, I'm really sorry. We're not going to give you that team. They spent all this time. They've changed their mind. And then you evaluate and select the final bidder. By the way, it's an opportunity to conduct a short POC if being necessary. We actually had one solicitation. Was a chunk we actually created a short POC of one week. And the reason was it was in Calvax. And I'll talk about it a little bit in Calvax. So next slide, please. Hey, Ben, we have another question. And Cameron is also responding to this. And he's been really good answering the questions in the chat box. But I wanted you to weigh on this as well. Um, Ken says, uh, isn't your internal team overwhelmed having to work with several different suppliers on perhaps slightly different approaches every week? No, no, it really isn't. Because remember, they're always building the same, to the same scenarios. They're, they're building same, the same scenarios, the same use cases, the same requirements. And the second of all, with respect like that, is they're also, uh, what they're building is their approach. But what they see is a different, color, a, a different approach in how they designed it. You know, and they say, well, this bit of designed it a little differently where they go into this particular uh, API differently than another bidder, but it is not. We have never run into a problem where the departments and the evaluation committee are trying to keep up with everybody. And I'll show you in the next slide, a key thing, why it's not. So we have never ran into that problem. Next slide. Okay, this particular slide, if you, if you don't remember anything I said, please remember this slide. This is such a key slide. The key factors for a successful challenge-based procurement. This is things that from a lessons learned, I've tweaked this thing over 18 months and I really got this thing honed down pretty, pretty good associated with that. Keep the number of scenarios, the outcome-based use cases between three to 10 scenarios. Don't go overwhelmed. I talked about this morning about one department that came out of a huge number of scenarios and I got them down. And it's pretty easy. Since I've been involved in, in so many uh, challenge-based procurements, it's pretty easy for me to look, to look at scenarios now and say, no, 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 this scenario is too busy. You, you need this because tell me your objective. I want to understand your objective. I understand your objective. This is how you can change your scenario. Okay, second bullet. The POC is organized and structured by the state, i.e. the scenarios and the mid-level requirements. But that sub-bullet is key. However, it, it's absolutely owned by the bidder for the PO system development, created environment, and presentation to the state. Do not place the state in the bidder's POC development or an environmental connectivity path. Once you provide POCs, the bidders, their scenarios, they're responsible for building their system. They build it in-house, they build it in their environment, they build it on their computers. You don't have to worry about interconnectivity. They don't want, you don't have the problem with, well, well, we need to, you know, uh, we need to connect with your particular system. No, 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 don't do that because then it's going to be finger pointing. Well, the reason I couldn't do my, I couldn't bring up my screens is because I couldn't connect with your system. Don't. You put the onus on them and you make it very clear in the solicitation that they're going to build the system, their POC, in their environment and they're, they're ready for it. 
Do not minimize the POC duration to save time. Uh, lesson learned. We ran one POC in 11 days. Not smart. <laughs> Not smart. It ended up being it ended up being a, a, a smoke and mirrors POC. And by the time we finished it and everything associated with that, it uh, when the we finally selected the bidder, uh, it turned out that the bidder then looked and said, "Oh, so this is what we're supposed to build? Oh, okay, then we're going to need more time." Not smart. So don't shortchange your POC duration. Fourth bullet, state should strive to supply real data for the bidder's POC. This is really important. Give them, if, if you can, in the real data of what you want the system to be utilizing because it sits in the bidder's POC data conversion capabilities, i.e., can they handle duplicate data? Can the bidder's fuzzy logic analysis with respect like that? Now, let's assume, you know, and we've had many departments says, wait, Flores, I cannot give them this data. It's absolute, it's got social security numbers in there and things like that. No, no, okay, you work with the department and say, look, I understand that. Then create me a data set department and scramble, scramble the social security numbers. And what you're looking for is Ben Flores, has a social security number of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that the same thing as Benjamin Flores, who's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? And what you're doing is you want to see the bidder's fuzzy logic to see if they can determine that's the same person. So that's the way to get around the, the concern of the department say, I cannot give them this PI data. I just can't do it. Well, then work with the department during the time frame of the phase one. They have the data set already created and they're ready and they've already scrambled all of it. Associate, we had to scramble the data for like for Calvax uh, because uh, it had medical doctor's licenses, numbers in there and things like that and their addresses in there. So they just scrambled the data associated with that and made it pretty easy. The state should, uh, um, the state, this is the other thing. The state needs to have continued access to the bidder's POC system throughout the POC duration. This is something I came up with. I thought to myself, okay, I see the bidder provide me scenario one and two Monday from nine to 11. Okay, I saw it. Okay, I forget what I just saw or they went so fast on it, I wasn't clear. So what I did is I came up with an idea. And what it is at the end of the day at 5 p.m., the bidders must create a POC sandbox where they deposit whatever they presented, they put deposit it in the sandbox and it allows the bidder, it allows the departments at their own leisure 24 seven access to the bidder's POC. So they can start playing with it, associate with it. And I tell you, that's turned out to be a gold nugget. The departments are really excited. They get to play with the system for a week or so and then they come, come back the next week and they're more knowledgeable. Here's a critical point, dedicated state resources. You're gonna to need to have state the evaluation team and the key, and the key uh, subject matter experts are required during the entire solution. It is a very labor intensive effort. If you think about it, everything that I've just said, it says, wow, it does sound like it, especially during the POC. Think about it. You maybe you have three POC bidders, you give each one uh, uh, two hours to present their particular, uh, you know, uh, their particular weekly effort, and then you have a usually an hour debrief. So if I'm in a, on the evaluation team, I lost three hours times three. That's nine hours, and that doesn't count the time that I'm playing in the sandbox. But I will share with you, the departments are really at first they kind of push back on this. But once they get involved in the POC, they really start getting excited because they're starting to see, I really like this team. The bottom line is the final bidder selected is the uh, yeah, final bidder selected should be based upon the actual interaction with the bidder's team POC and workable code. If the bidder truly can perform in the contract, not a bidder's paper proposal, or trust me. Next slide, please. Hey, Ben, we have a really good question here from Neil. 
Uh, do you have bidders who decline to take the risk of doing a POC? Do companies decline to bid? Do I have bidders? Yes. Uh, no, yes. no. I have not had a bidder decline to take the POC because guess what? Um, they are, they, they're told in phase one, in, in phase one, that if you're selected, you will go to a POC. And they actually, I thought about that, so I actually inserted a contract. In the phase one, they actually sign a contract. So if they're selected for the POC, they sign the contract. So they're already on the hook. The next slide. Okay, this is real quick. This is Calvex. And I'll go through these. These are pretty good. We had we started off with 31 vendors. Again, there's the funnel. We went down from nine vendors, and then we went to phase two, we went to three vendors, and we went to one vendor. And Calvax, what Calvax was, the state of California, that's when they were giving us the vaccinations uh, for, the, uh, for the COVID. And we were getting them from the federal government and they were coming to California. And Calvax was the system we had to create to manage the intake of all these uh, vaccines that were coming in and to manage the disbursement across the state of California. Next slide, please. Phase one. Oh, I'm so, you can go to the next slide. And I'll go ahead and pop down, pop down, keep going there. Okay, streamline process. We do, just give you a, a quick idea. We started well, with 50 pages on the compliance. The proof of concept was 475 pages. Remember, we used solicitation builder in doing this, created the proof of concept and the negotiations for three vendors who participated in phase two. Now, look at that. They decided to move forward to negotiate with all three vendors simultaneously. I made that decision purposely because I, there was one, uh, I was a little curious on one vendor with respect to the way they, they put their cost prop together. And I was, when I looked at their cost prop and I started asking questions about their cost prop, I was a little bit troubled with what they were saying. And I was, you know, you're not just going to drive the cost down, but I was a little bit troubled. So what we did is we actually came up with a final bake-off of a POC of one week with the three vendors. Why? And there was another reason. We got told, would you believe, in the middle of phase two, why we were doing a POC by the federal government, oh, state of California, guess what? You're going to get your vaccines six weeks earlier. Oh, my God. And here I'm in the middle of my POC. And everybody knows when they're supposed to start. So I basically went back to the bidders and I say, okay, I not only want you to, we're going to modify your, your, uh, your, your baffle, but I don't want you to see if you can deliver it six weeks earlier and what's the cost associated with that. And that turned out to be a win again. And the next slide is me. And that's it. Uh, uh, and it looks like I'm three minutes over. Oh, you're fine, Ben. Um, this is uh, a great time for more questions. If you all have any, type them into the uh, question and answer box, or you could just put them into the chat. So we're all monitoring that. Um, let's see here. We have uh, a question from Richard Pennington. Uh, in 2013, State Controller Task Force Report, recommendations to improve large technology procurements one of the challenges was the absence of flexibility caused by the feasibility study process and reporting to the legislature, who kept a rather tight control on funding, even functionality. And the agile approach, which sometimes requires trade-offs between scope and price, were you able to get the legislative buy-in that provided the needed flexibility? Absolutely great question. And I will share with you, uh, we actually addressed that in uh, one of the solicitations in about a year ago in HDIS when we were building the HDIS system because I actually requested the, the state of California chief data officer, Joy Bonaguerro, to participate in this activity. And I will share with you, she actually ghost wrote <laughs> the response of that particular report. And, and I, I probably the best compliment I got was from her. She said, this is the first time that we've come up with a, a procurement process that addresses not only the issues that are of a paper that it created in 2013, but more importantly, address the issues associated with the legislature. We have had absolutely no pushback 
from the legislature on this. If anything, they're asking us, uh, are you doing all your solicitations by challenge-based procurement, uh, CDT? And of course, Amy, our director, Amy Tong says, yes, we are. And that was the right answer. We got another one here from Jacob. Have you ever attempted to use performance information procurement system, PIPS? It is very similar, similar and proven very successful in our state. Are you familiar? And what do you see as the main difference? Okay, Jacob, uh, the answer to your question is no. I really don't know what the performance information procurement system is. I'd be very interested in seeing it because maybe we can trade uh, ideas with respect to some things that I have that you might want to consider. And I'd be really interested in what you have there because you may have some just some really great gold nuggets that I could like to utilize in what we're doing with respect like that. So uh, uh, I very much welcome uh, any, I, I welcome any state procurement official to contact me uh, to present any, uh, not only to present what they have, what they've been using, but also I'm more than happy to present the entire presentation, the long one, the hour and a half one to anybody, in, uh, anybody on the loop. Uh, we have another question here. Have you received any protests? Um, oh, great question. Uh, were there any new policies or statutes to address potential protests? And if you have had one, uh, what great. was that like? Great, great question. Thank you very much. First of all, we built, we, we rerun these under uh, public contract code 6611. Uh, with, uh, if you run the, if you, in the old, uh, before 18 months ago, we used to run our solicitations under public contract code 12100. And what that allows is that allows the vendors to protest anytime during the solicitation. When you run it under PCC 6611, you cannot protest during the solicitation. However, you can protest at the notification of a war. Now, here's the key point, and I'll get a little legal on you a little bit. I'm not an attorney, not yet, hopefully, maybe next year, uh, with respect like that. But here's the key point. Whenever a bidder submits a writ of mandate, and some of you who are attorneys out there, especially that one gentleman asking the question knows this, a writ of mandate is basically a complaint that is then submitted against, uh, against the California Department of Technology. And it's a complaint that is saying, hey, you know, I should have won. But the key point, and as you know, in any sort of complaint, is that the, uh, the plaintiff has to prove standing. And there's two things in standing that we always have to worry about in a writ. One is, is has the complaint, has the plaintiff had, uh, have been harmed? Yes, they lost the bid. They've been harmed, right? That's an easy one. But the second one is so key. The, the plaintiff has to prove because of an error, this is key, because of an error that was performed during the solicitation. We didn't follow some rule during the solicitation. Because of that error, that plaintiff would have won the deal. That is a tough hurdle to, to achieve. And the answer to your question is, under my watch, I've never had any writs of mandate. I know a couple on my, uh, my uh, my other co-assistant uh, deputy director, she's had a couple in her area, but been able to uh, definitely easy to show clearly she didn't violate anything. The key is you just have to do what it says in the solicitation. That's why anytime anybody wants to do something differently, I always say, okay, let me look at the solicitation. Did we say we can do that or did we say we couldn't do it? If we said we can do it and we're okay. If we said we did, couldn't do that, then we can't do it. Keep the case. So we've been clean. All right, we have uh, time for one more question. Um, can these be multi award? If you recognize that a vendor is good in one area of a scenario um, or during the proof of concept um, time, uh, are you able to split it up or is there a possibility for multi award? Right. I understand the question. The answer to your question is no. We do not 
The key is when you go into negotiations, the key is you should go into negotiations with multiple vendors. And therefore you have discussions, you know, and you can talk to them all at the same time and you can play one against the other. But here's something you can do. So you always select the bidder, you know, you always go with one, you know, with your, but remember, remember when I said, when you go into negotiations, you're looking at, you're looking at the POCs of the three bidders. And if you like, you really like two, but you really like something that bidder number one did, well then stick it in the requirements in the baffle. And then therefore all three bidders, and this is where your fear, all three bidders get to rebid on the entire new set of requirements. That's what I should say. But here's something you can do to get around it. And this is the workaround. And that is, you just, you, and we, we're actually doing this with one, uh, because one of the departments is considering a different approach. They haven't even, and it has nothing to do with the POC. We're just gonna have them let them submit an alternate proposal. So, you know, and so we'll let them submit a proposal and all three bidders submit an alternate proposal and then we can select that. I said one more question, but I lied. All right, this is the last one. How do you absolutely prevent the use of state data by, by losers to market their unselected to oh, to the to potential other potential bidders? Yep, just well, calculate it only intellectual property. Okay, one of the things, I think that's a great question. And, and that actually came up in one of the departments, they were really worried about that. So what we did is we gave them scrambled, we made sure we gave, we scrambled the data. So yeah, go ahead and give it to anybody you wanna give it to. The data has been scrambled. It's worthless to you, associate, because it only matches the POC. That's the key. So go ahead and use that data and try to use it somewhere else. Uh, it, uh, does California own intellectual property developed and tendered in pursuit? Yes, yes, they do. We make sure that's part of our solicitation. We do own uh, the intellectual property that's part of our GSPD's 401 ITs. All right. Thank you, Ben and Cameron. That concludes today's presentation. That was excellent, guys. I want to thank our presenters, Ben Flores and Cameron Sadiq, for the valuable information they've shared today and for working with us here at NASPO to bring this to you. Thank you all for attending this webinar today. You all will receive a follow-up email containing today's slides and materials. Remember, this webinar qualifies as one contact hour. To receive your certificate, simply fill up the survey in your browser window once you've exited the webinar. This webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing on the NASPO YouTube page in the coming days. Questions answered, entered into the chat and Q&A boxes have been saved and we will try to follow up via email for any of those who that have not been addressed during the presentation. Thanks again to our wonderful presenters and thank you to our guests and attendees today. Have a good one.